This episode of The Curbsiders is sponsored by the American College of Physicians. The American College of Physicians is thrilled to announce its first National Internal Medicine Day being held on October 28th. You can visit www.acponline.org forward slash I am proud for further details. Science podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. And the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity aside from possibly cash back more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much we are responsible if you're wrong. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're right. Uh, well, hello everyone. This is this is Matt Watto here without my two normal co-hosts. I do have a wonderful co-host tonight, uh, who I'll introduce in a second. But this is the Curbsiders. Tonight we're going to be talking about tuberculosis. And since Paul and Stuart both couldn't make tonight, I guess I'll I'll take Paul's normal part and tell you that on this show we curbside the experts to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. Tonight definitely will be practice changing for me as there was a lot of things about this topic that I didn't understand that well, and now I do. I should warn you that up front, we like to get to know our guests and talk about things sometimes outside the world of medicine, and we definitely did a little bit of that tonight. As Paul always reminds you, uh, if you're a good person, you will listen to the first 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, It will make you feel warm and cozy inside. And uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce my wonderful co-host, returning guest host, Hannah R. Abrams, who who runs our Twitter account, uh, famously runs our Twitter account. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Matt. All right. So this was an episode with a whole block of pearls for us. So we talked about latent TB, active TB, diagnosis, treatment. We ran through the new CDC guidelines, uh, and we talked a little bit with Dr. Wachoburn about how she handles some of the trickier episode or trickier issues like isolation, when to really commit um, to a treatment plan, and how she counsels people about some of the new treatments. Yes, and why don't you tell them all about how wonderful Dr. Wach Coburn is, and and read her bio. Yes, she is quite wonderful. So Dr. Walt Coburn is the is an associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine in the section of infectious diseases, and she's the director of medical education for the National School of Tropical Medicine. She is the medical director of Baylor College of Medicine Infectious Diseases Group and the Tropical Medicine Clinic at Bentop Hospital in the Harris Health System. She received her MD from Universidad Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala and later did her internal medicine residency at Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois. She completed her fellowship training in infectious diseases and HIV medicine at Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio, and received the diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene. At Baylor, she's received numerous clinical teaching awards and is the chair of the faculty senate. Her passion is educating the next generation about both the art of medicine and of infectious diseases. And tonight she taught us a ton about Hamlet's disease. Uh, come again? Hamlet's disease. You know, TB or not TB? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm really glad. I'm really glad for Paul's sake that he's not here. Uh, for Stuart, I'm sad because he would have liked that. And I kind of liked it too. It was, it was actually okay. I'll, I, I liked it. Well yes. done. <laughs> <laughs> Lila, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited. This is a topic that it seems like no matter how much I review it or how much I learn it, I, I just, I, I have never gotten it as straight in my mind as I would like to. I'm really glad you're here to talk to us about it. But first, why don't you tell the audience about yourself in a one-liner? I'm an infectious disease doctor, clinical educator, woman and underrepresented minority advocate, Latina, runner, foodie, and traveler. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> Where's a, So you said you're both a traveler and a runner. So anywhere particularly interesting that you've gone running before? So I, I tried to do runcations. So uh, my favorite distance is a half marathon. So I try to travel and look where I can do a half marathon so I can know the place. So oh my it's kind of fun. Yeah, there's no one in the, you know, taking photographs at seven o'clock in the morning in Rome. So you can actually get these great photographs. And when you say you're doing a, a run 
run vacation or runcation? Do you it, are you actually doing official races or is it just you? You go to a city, you get out your running shoes, and you just kind of run around, get lost, take pictures. So both. So I sometimes go for you know, like I did last year. I did Chicago. This year I'm going back to Guatemala to do a, a half marathon. So I always try to look for one place or another. So when I hit the big O, I'm doing a full marathon in Paris. All right. Amazing. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Is it going to be the formal marathon or are you just going to run for 26 miles? <laughs> it's April 11th, 2021 is the marathon in Paris. Oh my gosh. To celebrate the big, big, big ones. <laughs> okay. That sounds awesome. <laughs> All right. So uh, another question we often ask on the show is uh, what's a book that every physician should read? So if we were also going to Paris, what should we read on the plane? Oh, well, if you're going to Paris, that's, uh, you know, depends which airline you take, you might take longer. But one that I just recently read, and I'm a, I love history books, especially if I can apply them to my life, is the Leonardo da Vinci by Walter Isaacson. And it actually narrates the lives of Leonardo. And it's very interesting for, for actually for an ID physician because it connects art and science. And so it's that scientific reasoning and relentless pursuit of an answers. And that's what we do in infectious disease. Demonstrates passion and ability to stand at crossroads of between humanity and science. So I thought that was a great book to, you know, exemplify a renaissance man and what actually an infectious disease doctor is all about. Yes, he's. I, I heard him. He was when he was doing uh, press for that. He was on a bunch of different podcasts, and I think he wrote Steve Jobs' biography that was really popular as well. He's just a. He's a really great writer. Yeah, this the Steve Job is recommended for people who are looking into leadership positions because it talks to about how he changed a culture and how he had a following, and he was an influencer. So speaking of kind of leadership type things, can you give us some advice uh, for anyone? We have listeners kind of that are, they might be students, that trainees or, or educators. What, what's some favorite advice you've gotten that you wanted to share with the audience? Uh, one is probably one that has helped me. And this comes from a very good friend, uh, Francisco Marty. He says, don't cover, but discover. So instead of just pouring antibiotics, you really have to know why you're doing that. So you have to uncover the why. Um, from other things is, I think from my mom is that you can achieve anything. Um, that has been kind of, um, I'm a foreign medical graduate who came to the United States and kind of done everything. She's like, okay, you want to do it? You can reach for it. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Walk, did you have any picks of the week? So every week we kind of pick... Um, something that's inspired us or made us a little bit more cheerful in the past week? Anything that's been made to your week better? Actually, yes. It was a patient that I saw yesterday in my clinic. Uh, the patient is one month um, after liver transplant, and this patient looks great. And besides me talking about things, I gave her a hug. We cried together, and we're so happy. She started with a month ago with a bilirubin of, like, 25 and about to die. And a month later, she's walking into my clinic like nothing. So that's what makes your day. Amazing. Yeah. Hannah, before we move on to talking about tuberculosis, because we have tons of questions, why don't you give a pick of the week? Yeah, well, so kind of in keeping with the idea of um, cover, or rather discover rather than um, cover, um, there's this really funny guy on Twitter that I think anyone who's interested in ID and interested in this podcast should consider following. His name is, um, it's, his handle is at ID Doc Addy. Uh, his name is Aditya Shah and he, Dr. Walk's nodding. So I don't know if you're following him. He posts these hilarious gifs about antibiotic stewardship, which sounds a little bit strange, but, um, it's, uh, it's the most millennial combination and way to spread this message of antibiotic stewardship. I, hard to describe, but we'll post some on the Curbsiders Twitter or retweet. Um, he's a pretty funny follow, something that's made my week a little brighter. I, I definitely don't think I've seen this yet. Now I'm curious to check it out. It, oh, <laughs> it's, it's great. It is actually quite hilarious. You know what else is a funny Twitter follow is... Uh, I think it's like the epic EHR Twitter oh handle. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, we could put the actual. I don't. I don't remember the actual handle. This is just off the cuff, but we could we could put that in the show notes for you. Yeah. 
Paul and Stuart, I wanted you guys to help me remind the audience that this October 28th, 2019 is the first ever annual National Internal Medicine Day, which basically celebrates the awesomeness of internal medicine. Stuart, did you want to tell us why you personally are proud to be an internist? I know you have strong feelings about it. You've dedicated your life to this practice Look, and Matt. to raising five kids and lots and lots <laughs> of pets. Look, Matt, I'm, I'm proud to be an internal medicine physician, mainly because I get to do so many things, make an impact in so many people's lives. And frankly, I, I, I wouldn't choose another career. I really do love what I do. And I, I can't say that strongly enough. I like educating. I like training. And frankly, I just love medicine. Yeah. I mean, the guy's <laughs> working like 2.5 FTEs, Paul. Clearly, he loves his job. <laughs> I'm just picturing him sitting on a chair backwards with his baseball cap turned around, just talking to the kids, <laughs> really just getting real with them about internal medicine. Okay. So, uh, Paul, why don't you tell people how they can enter the ACP's I Am Proud contest, and they should enter by October 28th because they can be eligible for the first rise of, round of prizes. We are asking you to flood the internet with your internal medicine pride so you can tell a story, recognize a colleague or mentor, just in general, spread your love for internal medicine. Um, like Stuart, um, get real with the kids and be sure right. to tag at ACP internist <laughs> and use the hashtags, hashtag I am proud and hashtag National Internal Medicine Day on social media. Submit a form online to tell why you're I am proud for a chance to win prizes. For further details, go to www.acponline.org forward slash I am proud. Well, Hannah, why don't you get us started with a case from Cashlack Memorial Hospital? Absolutely. All right. So Miss Mimi Marquez is a 21-year-old college pre-medical student who comes into your office after a screening PPD that she did before some hospital shadowing, returned at 10 millimeters of induration. She hasn't had any cough, fevers, night sweats. She has no past medical or surgical history, and she has no exposure, known exposure to individuals with TB. But in the past year since her last PPD, she's traveled to New York, Texas, and Latin America with exposures to healthcare environments in each place. So kind of to start off for a patient like this, how would you interpret her PPD in the context of her exposures? Well, Hannah, it's, uh, PPDs are always hard to read. And I think it depends on what they, you know, you have to read the induration. It's not the redness around, the erythema. So you actually measure the diameter between one side of the induration and the other one. And you want to do that around 48, 72 hours. So never place a PPD on a Friday because the patient is not going to come on a Sunday. Um, so that is one reason PPDs are a little bit uh, cumbersome to do because you have this wait time. So this is typical board question that you get asked on the steps and in internal medicine boards. And, I, you know, I have some of my residents who don't actually answer that. So we divide it into three parts, 5, 10, and 15. Five are for those uh, patients or people have, who, have been exp who are HIV positive, had recent contacts with active TB, have you order a chest x-ray when you have this PPD, you see some nodular or fibrotic changes, someone who's immunosuppressed. And what is immunosuppressed? It means that they either have an organ transplant, they might have a stem cell transplant, and they are out. And immunosuppression is defined as having a prednisone more than 50 milligrams per kilogram per day or being on an anti-TNF anti alpha. So those are for the five millimeters. Uh, our, our Mimi here has uh, a 10 millimeters and, you know, she's college pre-medical. Um, so 10 millimeters usually means recent arrival from a high prevalence country. So let's say you're coming from, uh, for example, Eastern Europe, Russia, China, Peru, those places that have prevalence, South Africa. You want to do a PPD and it's, if it's more than 10 millimeters, uh, it is considered positive. IV drug abuse. Uh, what we call residents and employees at high-risk congregates, so it's health care, um, also jail, uh, comorbid conditions. Uh, there's been a little bit associated with diabetes and cirrhosis. That is actually the gray area of the recommendation. Children under the age of four and people who actually work with TB because they're exposed all the time. And anyone who doesn't have any of the risk factors, they will be at 15. So uh, Mimi... Um, you said that she had um, 
she is a pre-med, so she's going to be going to uh, a medical part. She's been kind of exposed um, to certain areas. So we do consider New York, Tessa, Texas as a little bit of an endemic, especially in New York. If you travel on the subway that comes from the TV hospital. Uh, which so which in line is that? We should probably put <laughs> that in the show notes. <laughs> I, I have to Google it, but it's, it's the line. It's actually, there is a line there that you can get mail you know. about this. <laughs> Um, they should just change anyway, the name to the TV train. TV train, oh, there you go. Uh, and the Latin America um, in, in places that you're exposed. Uh, so she had 10 millimeters and she's at hospital shadowing. So that is actually a resident or an employee at a high risk co, uh, con- congregate. So that would be considered positive for her. Uh, th- this might be jumping the gun. Um, I was going to ask about like a, a repeat testing. I know sometimes they'll do a, a second test for people. I, I, I never really fully understood that. So you can, so PPD, um, there's a lot of reasons why you can have a, a false negative. So a false negative is you see the person at 72 hours and you have a flat and there's nothing. And so you say, well, maybe I need to do a booster. And that is the, what you're talking about is the second test is what we do for boosting. It's, it can double fire, it can misfire because if you have a very big reaction to it, um, sometimes you get a, a big ulceration. Um, the other thing is that the person might be allergic. So meaning that the person does not mount a response because you know, uh, the immune system doesn't do it. And so in that approach, you actually put uh, on the counter arm or the contralateral arm, you put um, uh, candy, the antigen, to see if you actually see a reaction. So just to make sure I'm understanding, you do the first one, nothing happens. And if you're worried that the patient just has no immune response, you put a second PPD on one arm and a candida antigen on the other arm, And if there's no reaction to the candida antigen, then you say, and the PPD, then you say that person just doesn't have, we can't trust the PPD. Correct. Okay. Interesting. And so that's why, you know, um, PPD has been controversial, Um, you know, and and, and people in the TV world started looking at how are other ways to to test for it. One is um, is that uh, patients who have the BCG vaccine, the uh, you know, they are the BCG vaccine is a vaccine that we give in um, high risk countries between the ages of zero and five years to avoid TB in the brain, so TB meningitis. And so the myth is, is that if I have the BCG, that's why I have a positive PPD. And there's some truth on that. Um, some of the proteins can interact with with the PPD that you have. So. You know, people started looking, what 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 are we going to do to differentiate and, and actually not have people saying, oh, I have the BCG and I have a positive PPD. I don't want to get treated. So that's when the interferon gamma release assays came into vogue. And this was very specific to TB. There's two specific regions, ESAT-6 and CFP-10. And that is very specific for TB and it's not sp- specific for the mycobacterium bovis that you find in the BCG. So if you had a patient with a history of BCG vaccination, would you just immediately start with the IGRA or would you place a PPD first? With- so, so, the BC, so the BCG immunity only lasts about, you know, up to the age of 10. So if they got this placed at the age of two or three and you're seeing this, this patient at the age of 30 or 40, it is not going to, um, it's not going to interfere. Um, we, we have, you know, um, where we live here in, in, in Houston, we're a big uh, um, immigration and global community. So we have people coming from all over from endemic who think that they had the, the BCG. They says, oh, I had the TV vaccine. So that's why my PPD is that way. Well, it's probably because they've been, you know, got a little bit of latent TV in them. Um, so in those patients, I prefer using the interferon gamma releasing acid, the IGRAS. With this patient here, uh, back to Mimi, so she's she's 21, she's got exposure in a healthcare environment, and she's got 10 meters in duration. Is she, is she someone you would just go ahead and treat, or would you even mess around with doing like an IGRA? What's the cool, actually, could you tell us this? Is it cool to say IGRA or IGRA? 
What to, what's the what are the hip ID docs called? Igra, 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 Igra. Igra. Is it always really? <laughs> yeah, it is. I saw, I, you can say Igra, Igra. This is like you know pronunciation. But if you're in England, uh, it's called T Igra because it's a T cell interfering gamma releasing assay. Oh, they cool. should call it like Tigra. Yeah, yeah Tigra. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. It sounds like a good way so, to make people so, get this. So test. in this yeah. patient, so Mimi has a positive uh, PPD or or, or Mantu or um, tuberculosis uh, testing. So um, you know, when you have patients that don't want to get treatment, we go through that. But we what we say in the in, in, in the ID world is that one of them is enough to start treatment if you need it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will you know, we're following more into the interferon gamma treatments because, you know, it's one patient, uh, you don't need any boosting, it's very specific, you can get the result in one day, uh, includes a positive control, so you also know if if it works or doesn't. The PPD has been used for many years, but it requires two patients and it's subjective whoever reads it, right? If you don't know how to do the little bump, you I've had patients that come and says, oh my God, I have a 25 millimeter. And then you go and it's like two, <laughs> <laughs> just have a big red part. Um, you know, and the other thing is you don't have a positive control. So you don't know if it's actually working or not going back to the using the candida antigen. So, um, I think we're lean, we, especially in immunosuppressed patients, we lean more towards the interferon gamma releasing assay. Mm-hmm. With the caveat that if you have a patient that is neutropenic, their CD4s are going to be low. And so the amount of, of interferon gamma being released is going to be low. So you might actually get a false negative. I wanted to ask you, because I don't, I don't think I do a good job of this. And maybe it's just because uh, at CashLack recently, I've seen a couple indeterminate tests. But can you tell us, uh, so the audience knows, when they get when they order, I'm going to call it an IGRA, when they order an IGRA, what is it going to return and what should they look for to say this is a positive or this is a negative test? So when you have um, an IGRA, you'll have, so there's two types of IGRAs in the market. So there's, the two ones that is, one is called TB spot, and the other one is called TB gold, quantiferon. Both of them uh, uh, measure the amount of interferon. The TB spot is, is an ELISA. So you actually count the little dots, and the um, TB quantiferon is actually, it's, it's, an, um, it's how much it releases. So that, that one is, an, uh, instead of an LE spot, it's an ELISA. So that's is luminescent reading. So what happens is that you get an indeterminate, and the first thing you have to look is you get you're going to get something called uh, control and mitogen and negative control. So you have a positive control, a mitogen, and a negative control. So you want to know that the test that you administer has actually turned positive. So that's why it's it's good to have the positive control. Uh, you also, um, you can see sometimes, uh, that when you look at it, the mitogen doesn't mount a good response and that might be the way that also it's not working and you have an indeterminate. There are reasons why you can have also an indeterminate, you can have it for, it interferes with things. So people who have autoimmune diseases somehow sometimes ends up having indeterminates. And the part of it is that you want to actually um, repeat it. Um, you know, especially if your suspicion is um, high. If it comes back and you repeat the 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 test, and continues to be indeterminate for the TV gold and borderline for the TV spot, then the likelihood of MTV or, M- or mycobacterium tuberculosis infection is is uh, on its likelihood uncertain or low. So, just to kind of recap, so the kind of two ways that you can get this indeterminate result is one, either the positive control didn't work well or to the, you have some sort of autoimmunity or some other condition that's affecting the performance of the spot or the mitogen. Is that 
That's correct. So some yeah. of the autoimmune, the other part that can also affect is what we talked about. If you have someone who is neutropenic, right? You don't have enough interferon gamma being released, so it actually turns the test negative. And this is a gray area. There are papers and papers <laughs> going back and forth, looking at different populations of what an indeterminate is. Um, I. I often see this in uh, in our in our cirrhotic patients, and what I do is I look at a chest X-ray. I take a very careful history and um, try to to see if the pretest probability is high for TB or not. Hmm. Yeah. So Mimi's chest X-ray um, comes back normal. So you can kind of move into how would you walk us through now the difference between latent and active TB for her. So, okay, so it's good that Mimi doesn't have active TB. <laughs> She's not out there giving TB to everybody. Um, so in the TB world, we talk about latent TB and TB disease. In the TB world, we like to call that is latent tuberculosis infections versus disease. Because you do have the, back, the mycobacterium, you know, but in a very, very small amount, it's alive but inactive. Why? Because your body came in, it went in through your nose, through your, to your lungs, the macrophages came by and kind of walled it off. And it's, you know, it has a nice little wall there and it stays there, but it's inactive. It's dormant, it's hibernated. You cannot spread it. Uh, you don't feel sick. Um, you know, you don't not producing sputum. You don't have constitutional symptoms. So that's, latent tuberculosis infection. What happens if you have active TB? So you, this one is when you have lots of bacteria, mycobacteria. So you're now coughing up, maybe a little hemoptysis, you feel sick, so you have fever, cough, you have weight loss, uh, malaise, loss of appetite, and your x-ray is going to be abnormal, and your sputums and cultures are positive. This is considered an active or infectious case because now you are able to transmit it and it has become alive to other people. You can go from latent to actual disease. So we talked about the macrophages just forming this nice little wall against the mycobacterium. And just like anything, like in your house, if you don't do maintenance over time, the, the wall crumbles. In our body, that means the immune system forgets to do the maintenance. And as we age, that wall crumbles. Uh, if we give immunosuppressant, the immune system is too preoccupied doing other stuff that is not going to, you know, repair the wall, and it crumbles. And whatever was inside, it comes out. And I'll start spreading because there is nothing to stop. It. So out of the latent TB, about 15% will turn into active disease. We see this in patients who are immunosuppressed and in patients who are what we call immunosenescent. As we age, our immune system ages. So this is why we want to treat it before, not, not at the age of 80 with four TB drugs, which are kind of toxic to your liver and you're 80. <laughs> right. Um, so you say is 80, is that kind of when, are we expecting to see these patients in like a geri clinic around the age of 70, 80? It depends. Yeah, so it, it depends. I said 80 because of a, a time. So our immune system starts immunosenescent about the age of 65. And we know this because our tetanus antigens go down and, and things like that. And so we want to treat before. Um, interestingly, if you're in an endemic country and you have latent TB, you're not treated. So you know why? No. Why? Yeah, why? Because you get reinfected. Right. Oh yeah. So if you're in, a, if you're in a coal mine, or I guess it's not a coal mine, a diamond mine, or a gold mine in in South Africa, and you're getting TB, there's no point of treating the latent because you're breathing the same air as everybody else. And remember, for latent TB, we use just one drug, so it becomes it creates resistance. That, yeah, that was that was something that uh, when I was reviewing for this, I, I hadn't really thought about because, like, usually we we don't see TB that often, fortunately, and when we do, we're treating that we're treating it all what, what, almost always if it's late in or if it's active. But I never really thought about the fact that you can get reinfected with TB. It's not like a, it's not like you have 
or, or do you get any protective immunity? So there's that uh, lightning again. I'm just going to call it oh. out to the audience so we don't have to keep re-recording. Uh, there, there, it sounds like there's a, a storm in Houston. So you're just getting some, I believe they call it audio verite there. Uh, that's the first time it went off. <laughs> diegetic I it was like, noise. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was like an air conditioner or something, but it was just lightning or thunder. Yeah, there's lightning and thunder. Yeah. No, no, the, 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 the streets are flooded and there's a oh, whole thing really? going on. Okay. Yes, they are. So this could be like a 10 hour <laughs> podcast. So you have nowhere to go. Yes. So we were, yeah. we were talking about it. It does. Is there any like, yeah. Is there like any immunity uh, to like future infections if you've gotten a TB one time? So, so that's what's, you know, that was the thought process with the BCG. You know, the reason to give the mycobacterium was, can you gather some immunity? And, and, and it only lasts for a little while. Uh, unfortunately, our, you know, the TB, the, anyone who studies TB knows that it's a very long process because it takes, you have to follow this patient for a long time. So there have been candidates and some more successful than others uh, looking for a TB vaccine. But you get TB once, you can actually get it again. So I always tell my patients, oh, okay, we treated you this one. Don't get reinfected. Don't go picking up more TV because you'll come back. <laughs> yeah. So Matt, I got to admit, um, I think about this all the time because uh, I live in Texas and this case is pretty loosely based on my experience in undergrad. So I'm definitely trying to avoid getting reinfected with TB. <laughs> um, so you would ask, why, why, do we, why, do, why does the U.S. care about latent TB? It's purely a, he a public health risk factor. Hmm. Because what you're trying to avoid is to get other people infected. So you are, let's say you are that 75 or 85-year-old man or woman who is living in a nursing home and you have a cough. You've had a cough for a while. No one, you know, oh, maybe it's your COPD. Maybe it's just, just chronic cough. And you're just kind of reinfecting the whole nursing home. <laughs> yeah wow so yeah, yeah once in a Which while is... those cases slip by you you hear about them uh they get uh, yeah once in a while you hear about some case like that where someone had a cough and people didn't recognize it was tb and then they had a cavity or something and they, they didn't realize that it was it might be tb uh till too late i get it so basically we're trying to make sure that we eradicate is because the because the level oh uh, there's more this is great <laughs> I might edit that one out because yeah. there's because there's just lower levels, low enough levels and low enough risk that you would get re-exposed here if we treat your latent TB in the United States or if we treat your active TB. Or, I mean, you got to treat active TB, but if you treat the latent TB, there's unlikely they're, they're unlikely to be exposed again and get reinfected. So it's actually worth the several months that the person might need to be on treatment. And maybe we should talk about treatment and Hannah can share some of her personal experience. Oh, uh, man. <laughs> we, so so, yeah. so before, before we go, so there is um, a one particular group that you do treat worldwide, and that would be if you're immunosuppressed like HIV. So, so there are studies on that. So I just don't want to make sure that it's like we don't treat this. But um, in HIV, we do TB-prevented treatment because if your CD4s are too low, you actually reactivate. And you can actually reactivate TB at any stage of the HIV disease. So even if their viral load and their CD4 count are, are well controlled, they could still reactivate? Yes, or get some new TB. Okay. So it kind of in light of all of that, how would you, if you are sitting with this patient with Mimi in clinic, how would you explain to her what the plan for treatment was going to be, what she should be looking out for, and what she needs to be doing during treatment? So usually when, when people come for latent TV, um, they're either freaked out or they're like, okay, give me the pills. <laughs> <laughs> I was the former. <laughs> I'll just fully admit that. So, so first of all, is is you know, I mean, Mimi's case is is particular because she is going to be at a um, healthcare facility, and you don't know uh, what's going to happen. So, you actually want to treat. So, you explain, you know, that you know, I go through why is uh, latent TB versus active TB. I reassure them because there's a lot of stigma with tuberculosis that she doesn't have active TB and she's not contagious. 
She's not going to spread this to the, she's not like Typhoid Mary and going around <laughs> coughing around little, <laughs> little bacilli and things like that. Then I said, you know, we have several options. Um, and, and interestingly, uh, this past year, we've had two um, CDC recommendations. One was last year on the new um, latent TB treatment with, his, with INH and rifapentin. And rifampin also came up to the limelight, and that was a New England uh, Journal of Medicine um, article. To the latest one in May, which is when to when not to when we should stop testing as much our healthcare workers for latent TB. So, so Mimi is here. So I usually what I do is since we're in the era of computers, I pull the computer. And I put the CDC. The CDC actually has an amazing website where you can actually look at the different the different regimens. So, you know, so we can start from the bottom up. The, the one that takes the longest, which is uh, isoniazid, which is nine months. So you tell them, you know, I have you have to take isoniazid. It's a little white pill with a little vitamin B6, so you don't get peripheral neuropathy and things like that. They usually freak out with that. Um, you take it for nine months. So the patient goes, you mean all nine months? And you're like, yes. And they, they say every day and you say, yes. So I said, okay, so there is the nine months treatment. This one is, yeah, you can have some, a little bit of side effects to your liver, but it's very well tolerated. Then you go to the one that is the second one. Uh, it's the rifampin that you give for four months. So rifampin is uh, is monotherapy. You take uh, 600 milligrams. You can take it at once. So you can take 300 in the morning and 300 in the afternoon with the caveat that you're going to pee orange. So it's kind of fun, you know. It's like I, I had some people that are like, oh, look, orange pee. Uh, the <laughs> other thing... <laughs> The other thing is that if you wear contacts, your contacts will turn orange. Yes, I've heard that one. I, I had a co-resident that was on on uh, rifampin during uh, during residency, and he was he was complaining about that. Yes, you have to change your contacts, or you get used to seeing orange tinted world. You know, just hmm. kind of like a sunblock. You know, kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, rose colored glasses. Yeah, the rose colors. You have orange tinted contacts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, and you know, and, and rifampin is, is not benign. Um, you can get fever, you can get a rash, you can have uh, uh, um, liver abnormalities. And then you come to the latest recommendation, which is 12 weeks, which means instead of taking a medicine uh, nine months or a medicine uh, four months, you can actually take one drug, uh, two drugs once a week for 12 weeks. And so, you, you know, this is recommended. Um, this is isoniazid and rifapentin. Uh, this is not rifampin. It is a rifampin derivative. Uh, you take this once a week. And, um, you know, you use, use Saturday or you use Friday. It does have to be um, with drug, uh, drug therapy or you can self-administer, especially if you're over the age of two. And then the biggest problem is that um, it, it has a very high load to your liver. It's, it's kind of big hepatotoxic because you're giving isoniazid about 900 and the rifapentin is about, uh, if I remember well, about 1,500. So... That is more of a of a big thing. And then, so no drinking during that time. Uh, we have a lot of we have. I imagine pre med students might still be in the partying stage of life. And so, can they can can I can I have a couple beers when I'm doing this or uh, wine coolers? I know Dr. Brigham, who's not here, but he likes um, uh, Zimas, <laughs> which are <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. That <laughs> That's how dating yourself. <laughs> it took me a second to think of it. <laughs> yeah, well, I was definitely like the little, the, yeah. the Corona refresher, right? <laughs> okay. So, so what I tell them is, I mean, if you, you know, either one, the INH uh, nine months, the INH rifapentin or the rifampin, you know, they go through the liver. So you want to be friendly to your liver. It's not fun to, you know, end up in the transplant list or, the, you know, the pre-transplant list. So I do get baseline uh, liver function tests. Um, I do ask them that, you know, abstain from drinking and abstain from fatty food. 
So not big McDonald's, big fried food. And the reason is, is trying to minimize, especially with the isoniazid and rifapentin, the amount of what your liver has to work that weekend. Right, <laughs> <laughs> you you don't you don't want the, the liver to be double timing and trying to run like three marathons and then by the time it, you know Tuesday comes is 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 out. You know, uh, the other thing is there are certain foods that you should avoid. Okay. So you yeah so so you know so one of the things is you avoid blue cheese. Perhaps more important to me as a college senior. Yeah. So, so can you tell, I had never heard about this before you told me. About Hot it. wings and blue cheese. That sounds, I mean, that's, that's a delicious meal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what, what's so, going on with that? What's the story? So, so the cheeses um, produce, or so they contain thiamine. And so th- when they have uh, interaction with isoniazid, you actually have uh, your blood pressure and your heartbeat I- increases. So you have hypertension and tachycardia, flushing and chills. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you, yeah, so you, I tell them, you know, you avoid the cheese and then that's if you have, you know, you can have hypertension. But on the other hand, there are foods that actually contain histamine, which can make you hypotensive. So I told them to avoid certain um, to avoid certain fishes like uh, tuna, herring, mackerel, uh, mushrooms, tomatoes, spinach, and vinegar. Is this just is this for the whole twelve weeks they're on this, or just just kind of the couple days after they take a dose? So I usually tell them the twelve weeks. Oh wow! Yeah, so it's probably uh, probably that the effect of the isoniazid rifapentin is worse. Let's say you started on Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. By the time you're hitting Thursday and Friday, it's less. I don't know that I like this diet. I'm going to try to avoid latent TB. Hannah, did you get such great <laughs> counseling when you were, uh, if you were taking medicine for this? I so I took I, INH for nine months. I, I was actually never given the option. So. Just to clarify, are all of these new kind of agents or options as first line therapy? Are these all with the new CDC guidelines? So the the new the new one is isoniazid and rifampin. You always have the option of rifampin and isoniazid. So I, you know, who do I give with? Which is, you know, so I also look at drug drug interactions. Right. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, so for example, my if I have a pre transplant patient. I I have to time it, right? Because I have to give them, they have to complete the time. If their liver, they're not going to get isoniazid and rifapentin because the liver is already shot and I'm not going to do. So if I know that they're not on the high ranking list on what we call a high melt, I probably do the isoniazid because it's not as, uh, as bad for the liver. If they're in a shorter period, I do the rifampin. The other thing is if they're in a shorter period, the isoniazid does not interact with your immunosuppressants. So we tend to use a lot of isoniazid because it's easier to take, especially uh, because of the drug-drug interaction of rifampin. It goes, you know, interacts with everything known to man. Yes. So you're saying if if someone's close to transplant, the the INH is is more friendly if they're going to be, have be transplanted during that period and it, they can take their immunosuppressive meds without it running wreaking havoc on the levels. Correct. Okay. Correct. So for for older for older sicker patients on a lot of medications that might limit your you like the your ability to prescribe rifa, rifampin and is rifapentin also the same kind of mess as drug drug interaction. Yes, correct. They come from the rifampin family. And, you know, it's it's when you look at who you can give the rifampin, um, you know, the CDC recommends the use of um, isoniazid uh, rifampin in persons of age 2 to 17. Mm-hmm. They also recommend this for uh, patients who have latent TB, who have HIV, uh, who have AIDS, and they're taking antiretroviral medications with the caveat that probably the rifapentin cannot interact with one of your medicine that you're taking for your um, antiretroviral. Um, and it has to be directly observed therapy. Hannah, before we move on, is there any, any loose ends to tie up with this case here? Yes. Yeah, so we've talked a little bit about the new 2019 CDC guidelines, but an element of them that we haven't talked about is the um, screening guidelines, and especially for sort of healthcare workers. 
is this kind of thing going to happen anymore? Who needs to be screened now with the new guidelines for, for TB? So this is a big recommendation. Um, the last time the guidelines were up- updated was um, actually 14, 15 years ago, was in 2005. So we can divide it into the four major parts that the guidelines address. One is screening, which is the one you're interested. So before we screen all healthcare personnel, you had a PPD or an interfering gap or an eye grab before at the day of hire. Like all of us as med students, all of us as residents, all of us fellows as new faculty, we have to go get our, our thing, right? So now you actually do a baseline TV a risk assessment. So you ask them if you actually have been exposed to TV, if you come from an endemic area, you ask them if they ever had a chest x-ray, have they been exposed? So for example, I, I, I don't know, and I don't know if Cashland has the same amount of, of, of TV that we see. I, you know, I've, you know, I, when I was back home in, in Guatemala, I had patients who like coughed up four plus AFB. So I'm a, I'm a risk, right? <laughs> Yeah. Interestingly enough, my PPD is negative. (laughs) Wow. And you run the TB clinic. Yeah. So So I guess when the, uh, I guess when the they do the M95 mass test, you don't lie and say you can't taste the stuff they're spraying. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So then, then the 2005 says annual screening may be recommended. You know, so every year we had to line up. We got those emails saying you need your PPD. The big recommendation is no longer you need that routine done if you, unless you have an occupational risk or ongoing exposure. So if you are, you know, you had your baseline, you were, you know, you weren't at risk and happened to be taking care of a TB patient and no one knew and you went into the room without your N95 and the guy was just coughing, the guy or the gal was coughing up to you, um, you're at risk. So you have to go get tested. Um, the, but that goes with the post exposure because you had actually been exposed. So there's no change. You still get tested for it. And you have, if your test is negative, uh, you, uh, you do uh, another test about eight or 10 weeks after the last exposure to make sure you're still negative. So the third component is treatment of positive TB tests. So we actually went through that. And so it's actually encouraged because we do have people that don't want to take the test, you know, the, the, the medicine, that all healthcare personnel should be treated for LTBI. You can choose whatever regimen, like we talked, the uh, 12 weeks, the rifampin for four months, or the INH for nine months, isoniazid. And then the other thing that they really want to see is TB education. So before it was recommended, now it should have annual education should include TB risk factors, how to identify TB, you know, fevers, weight loss kind of thing, and TB infection control policies and procedures to be updated annually. So it's less stringent on us, but more stringent on infection prevention. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess there goes the one benefit of uh, having taken INH, which is that I wasn't supposed to get a PPD every year. But I think it uh, hopefully will be a a good thing for all of my colleagues and for everyone not to get those emails about the PPDs. I love like the dramatic (laughs) thunder in the background as you're saying. Oh, (laughs) the thunder might be a little bit appropriate because unfortunately, our next case is a bit more ominous. All right. right. So next we have the case of Mr. Lenek. So Mr. Rene Lenek is a 45-year-old man who immigrated to the U.S. from Haiti 10 years ago and presents to your hospital emergency room for one month of cough, night sweats, and fatigue. This week, his cough became productive of blood, and he decided to come into the hospital, where his nephew said, after his nephew said he heard crackles over the right upper chest. Chest x-ray reveals a cavitary lesion in the right upper lobe of the lung. Uh, he's moved into respiratory isolation, and sputum samples are drawn. So with this case, after he's moved into, after Mr. Lenek has moved into, uh, into respiratory isolation, what do you need to do to eventually take off the respiratory isolation, remove the airborne conco- precautions, and rule out TB? So, I mean, he's um, it's a patient that has a cavitary lesion. And in our world, cavitary lesions always make us worry about tuberculosis. There's other reasons to have cavitary lesions, but they're not going to be spreading around. So the 
part that you do is you actually, you know, do your sputums, um, AFB smears. And um, it, you know, technology has changed, but let's say we're, we're, we're the same technology, the, the inexpensive TB diagnostic, which is doing a smear. Um, the sputum is sent to the lab, you do a smear, you look at under the microscope, and you're actually looking for um, TB. You can um, do um, you can do stain or you can do orin, which is a kind of a gold staining, which then you can look on the fluorescence and you see instead of red, you see something that is yellow and then you detect the, the TB. So, but AFB smears are very not sensitive. So technology has kind of um, moved forward and we do what we call nucleic acid amplification. And this, you need about 10,000 bacilli per ml to detect AFB in the AFB using the light microscopy, but you actually need less doing the nucleic acid facility, uh, uh, amplification. So uh, they are... Um, the, the NAS, or uh, for, for purposes, the NA, uh, you can use that. And there are some machines that um, have used molecular testing. And those are like, for example, the Expert, which is done, used worldwide, and it's also used in, in a lot of, um, a lot of um, hospitals that are able to detect uh, microbacteria and tuberculosis and also at the same time tells us if they're isoniazid or rifampin resistant. And do they still need to be the same kind of eight hours apart, three consecutive gene expert tests or expert tests? So, so for the so the sputum, you do have to have eight hours apart. So, what I try to do is get the one in the morning. So, you want to get one in the morning because you, you there's you know this nasal secretions. You go there, you actually can, I said, hack it up like a big gumbo and that's probably has <laughs> yeah that's what you a, want right <laughs> <laughs> that's what you are you got the big gum you know i mean if you look in in, in kids we we do a nasograstic aspirates because they actually swallow the, the the phlegm into the stomach and there's the inside that gumbo that sticky stuff is where the mycobacterium is found so you want to have a morning one so you know when the patient gets up you tell them to just you know hack it up and then um then you you want to do an eight, another eight hours. Don't do one in the night because there's you know in the micro lab you might not have someone, so that could be. Uh, that is what a lot of places do. With the nucleic acid, um, depends on the guidelines. You can actually be able to diagnose if they have TB in 24 to 48 hours, which is the expert, right? And so as long as you have one of those negative, uh, you know, if the amplified DNA test is negative, um, then you can actually um, take the patient I off see. isolation. Now, what I've learned is it depends on the policies of each hospital and all hospitals do not have the same policies. Does that make sense? So yeah. like the one, yeah. So the, so you have Cashland will have their things and the hospital up two miles after will have a different guideline. So you just have to get yourself used to the guidelines. To make sure that I understand, you're going to do the normal, let's say someone gets a an AFB, they, co they cough up their morning Goomba, and then you get two more samples at least eight hours apart. And if all three of those samples are negative, then we're, you know, depending on our suspicion, that might be good enough to say this probably isn't TB. But some hospitals have this expert test, which can, within 24 hours from one, just one sample, or you also want to get three of that, that, that can just rule, potentially rule out TB. So if you use uh, the expert testing, you need two negative sputum results. Um but in some cases, three sputums are still required for a ne for AFB smear negative. And that might so, be the uh, oh okay. So that might be depends on your thing. So the 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 guideline says you need two negative expert results negative. Mm -hmm. And they would so the same sample could be run on expert and an AFB done on the same sample, right? So you don't yes okay, okay. the. Is the expert sample widely used? I'm not sure that I've seen it at uh, Cashlack Northeast. I, I, I'm not sure if they're using it. I'll, I'll have to check because 
I didn't, I don't know. It seems like we're sending uh, three AFB smears and that takes, sometimes that takes us three days to get the three, three Goombas. It's, you know, it, sometimes uh, or, that's hard to come by. Or the patient can actually do a Goomba, right? That's, you have that, to, then, that, then you have to go to that hypersaline stuff and you do sputum, you know? I seem to get the patient that can't cough it up a lot of the time. That that seems to be a theme. Uh, I'm, I'm a black cloud in that regard. Yeah. So 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 the so interestingly, the expert has been FDA approved, and actually, the people who who have acquired more of this technology is developing nations. So, like Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia actually use the expert because you can detect TB and at the same time know if there's, they're refampant or INH mm-hmm. resistant. And it's a little cassette. Uh, the machine costs a lot of money, but uh, the little cassette, you put it in, you just need one sputum, you just, you know, not a lot. Um, and you can actually um, be okay, right? Right. So you can just, discon- you know, make a decision and actually do treatment. So if a patient comes to you and from, you know, you're in Malawi and a patient comes in and they have weight loss, you do a rapid test for HIV and you can get an x-ray and you have an expert, you ask them to cough it up and then you can actually treat their um, TB at that time, you know. So are you starting ripe kind of immediately and then adjusting based on the gene expert to say if it's um, if it's resistant to something or do you wait for the the gene expert results to start any kind of therapy or just so you the wanna, culture if you don't have the yeah. expert right well the culture will take you about eight weeks I had a patient that was week seven day six out of seven when it came positive. So what you want to know is what's your incidence of resistance in the area? In the U.S., it's low. Mm-hmm. But if I have a patient that is coming from Russia or I have a patient that is coming from China, you know, or a patient coming from South Africa, which are the ones that we call the XDRs where we scare, then, you know, I, I actually tap my good colleagues up in um, Tyler, Texas, which is called Heartland TV. They're, uh, they are the the... I guess the reference center, uh, uh, Dr. Seaworth as well, Armitage and Kisselbash run the center. And then if we have questions, that's when I call them because um, that would be the case that is not your average. Um, each region of the U.S. has a regional TB reference um, place. So you would send hmm. the sputum there. They would run. They would have the equipment to run a test and get you a quicker result on whether or not this person has resistance. So, so no, so we send the samples, the sample is sent from the hospital to the city where they, they should be able to, you know, the state health or the city health. Um, the, the part where I say mean is that I contact them is if I have a patient that comes from one of these multi-drug resistant endemic areas and I have a high suspicion for um, TB. And so I would not start your normal uh, refampin, isoniazid, PCA, ethambutol. So I would call them and says, "What would, what should I start? Because I it's going to take a while to grow." Right? Okay, and then they would know they would they would be able to figure out the local resistance patterns in that from that region and and guide you on therapy there. Correct. Be- before we get into a little bit further in the treatment, I think this comes up a lot in the hospital, and this is probably where I felt most uncomfortable with potential TB cases is when maybe you get somebody from like, like you said, these endemic areas, uh, Russia, let's just use, let's use Russia. Someone from Russia comes in with a pneumonia. They don't have a cavity and the symptoms seem relatively acute. They've been less than a week before that the person was pretty healthy. And now they're coming in with this kind of pneumonia. Like, is that someone that you would always isolate and start sending TB? Because, you know, then they're going to be in the room with the mask and people aren't going to visit them as often. I just kind of worry about that. And it's... So, so it all depends, right? So one of the first things I would do is an HIV test. Mm -hmm. So if they're HIV and they have a normal chest x-ray, they go to a room. Okay. Abnormal chest x-ray and HIV, they're going to a room, suspicion is high. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the reason is that you it can look like anything, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say you run a test HIV negative. You look at the chest x-ray, you look to see if there's cavitary disease. 
That's what you're looking for. Um, you know, could this be reactivation? And that's a little harder. But I would ask your, your friendly radiologist to, you know, read and see, do we see cavitary disease? Do we see GONS complex? So any calcifications that they will suggest of prior um, TB disease, you know? And if the answer is no, then the suspicious load, they don't have to go. So who do I put on droplet uh, precautions? So patients that are known for untreated uh, pulmonary or laryngeal TB, cavitary disease, um, someone that has positive sputums, and someone that has not actually converted their sputum culture yet. You know. And you mean for this patient here from Haiti, we're putting him on because he's got a pretty convincing clinical history, chronic cough, night sweats, and then he's from an endemic area and the chest x-ray has a cavitation. But if, if it's just somebody with um, maybe a little bit less of a concerning clinical history and they're from an endemic, but they're from an endemic area, they, let's say they don't have a cavity, but they do have like a month of cough and some of these symptoms. So you would, you would wait until you get some sputum to take them off droplet. You would put them on droplet. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And it depends on, I guess it depends on how recently they've come from the other country and things like that. Does it, does that factor into? Yes. I mean, you know, so remember the PPDs, if they're less than five years, they still can turn positive. Um, I mean, that's when we read them at 10 millimeters. So you have to get a good history, have a very strong pretest probability. And and I said, the caveat is, do are they HIV positive or not HIV positive? All right. Okay. The caveat, the cavity yeah. caveat. Um, all right. <laughs> so, sorry, Mr. Linux sputum AFB comes, po- comes back positive times three. He started on RIPE. Um, after four days in the hospital, his clinical status is a little bit improved, and his nephew asks, when can he go home? So how, when would you send him home, and how do you set him up with DOT versus kind of unobserved therapy? Would you ever do unobserved therapy? So, so first of all, I would ask if the nephew has been screened for TB since he's been living with, <laughs> with Mr. Lanek. That is one thing. <laughs> um, so, first of all, all anything that is TB related, you have direct observed therapy. So, direct observed therapy means that there is um, a nurse or a healthcare worker that goes to your house and gives you your medicine at least Monday through Friday. And they count the many the doses. There's, we don't let patients to go unobserved. Um, that that is that is because um, you really want to do. And and the reason is that you're taking a lot of medicine. So you initiate the treatments. So what does the treatment comes? It comes in a little plastic bag and a little plastic. You have two rifampins. Uh, one INH, one vitamin B in one bag. And then you, comes the big box, which is the Sambutol and the PCA. So the Sambutol will be about four and PCA maybe three. So you already have seven. So I'm counting on my fingers and I just ran out of fingers. So, so, <laughs> so you're taking 11. about 12 to 18 pills. Wow. Now imagine that poor Mr. Lanek has to take his insulin and his metformin and his hypertension meds. So he's taking about 25 pills. If you let poor Mr. Lanek at home without anyone, do you think he's going to take all of the TB treatment? <laughs> poor Mr. Lanek. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here's another yeah. question. How many of you finish your antibiotics when it's prescribed? Maybe I've had the good fortune of not uh, yeah. being prescribed any, but I don't take any. <laughs> That's good. I don't like yeah, to take anything. Kind of yeah, I don't think I'm going to be a very good patient when I become one. So, so that's why we have direct observed therapy, because what happens with TB, it mutates very slow, but rapidly it, it learns it's an A plus student, you know? And so you give them enough and it starts mutating because it wants to survive, right? It's another, you know, find out nice cushy job. He has like oxygen in Mr. Lennox lung. Why should he like give up the host? The host probably can live about 10 years with TV. Why, why, why should I go and infect someone else? I, you know, I, so they become resistant. So the direct observed therapy is to ensure that patients do take their treatment and we have minimal. 
I mean, I've seen all antics about this. I've had patients who put pills inside their pillows, inside their mattresses, ones that they put them behind and then throw them up, ones that pretend to take their pills and they don't. I mean, this is like when you go to a psych ward and they ask them to go up with their tongue to make sure that they're actually swallowing the, the, the pill. I mean, are folks having a lot of side effects? Like, is there, what, what is the reason that people don't want to take all of these pills other than the burden? Well, so if, if you usually take it on an empty stomach, so you're taking all this, oh, medicine, so you get a lot of nausea and you feel, you know, you feel weak. I mean, it's, 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 it's not easy to take all those pills, you know, um, some of them, you know, like, for example, uh, rifampin could give you some malaise. Uh, I mean, you can have fever and a rash and you can have the hepatitis and things. But like, for example, uh, ethambutol. Ethambutol can give you gout. It can give you altralgias, really bad. PCA can also, pyrosemonide can give you hepatitis. You can feel also bad. So there is a lot of things. It's not a very benign. And you have to do this for, you know, at least two months before you go down to just refamp and isoniase it for four months. So it is, it's a lot. And let's say you're, you know, you, you, you have TB. You lost, I don't know, 40 pounds. Your muscles are all debilitated and you're trying to swallow this pill. So it's kind of not fun. It, that's, that's the problem. Mm. So, so we have healthcare workers that go in and give this meds and they do an amazing job. And, and I think that they're the greatest because some of them, when they go knock at the door, especially here in Texas, might get themselves in front of us, a, 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 a gunshot. <laughs> Because, you know, in Texas, you can have, if you pr trespass, you can actually shoot the trespasser. So, they, you know, so the idea is that you knock the door and you duck. So <laughs> there's a shot. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. That, that is actually yeah. a true story from I, one of the I hope you're the paying them well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and then going back a second. So for Mr. Linek here in the hospital, he's been here for four days. He's feeling better wants to know when he can go home. When do you send these patients home? So you want to have some, um, since his sputum was positive, the, the, the rule is that you want to have treatment for two weeks or negative smears. Okay. So one or the other, whichever comes first. Yes. And then you send them home and you tell them that they, they cannot go to the mall. They cannot go to the supermarket. Um, they kind of, if, if they go out, they do have to use a surgical mask. So that's the protection. So the person who is not infected, so the, I guess the, the healthcare worker will wear an N95. The patient will wear a surgical mask. And what about the patient's family members that are living with them at home? Oh, they're already being contaminated. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. <laughs> they have latent TB and yes. they might need to be treated for that. Yes. So if the, what they do, once you tell, tell the city or the county or the state that you have an active case of TB, they will go to the house and do a risk assessment and we'll take, um, we'll do PPDs and we'll take sputums and then we'll tell you, you know, this people tested positive or not. My friends that did, there was a rotation d during, um, when I was in Texas, there was a rotation at a TB hospital uh, I guess it was near San Antonio where I was living and they, uh, you, I was told that outside the patients, you know, if you're talking to somebody with active TB outside, doesn't the, something about the light, like it's, it's harder for it to be transmitted. Is there any truth to that? So we use UV light. So yes. So, so the, the hospital is, is one of the few hospitals in the United States that, you know, like the old ways that we used to have the sanatoriums. This are, uh, is a hospital for TV, especially if we have uh, multi-drug resistant TV, we, we actually ask them to be over there or if they're not going to be taking their medicines. So the UV lights. So when you go to a TV clinic, you will see that there is this ultraviolet light in a lot of the rooms. So the ultraviolet light actually kills the, the mycobacterium. And it has to be a specific length. I had to look for this for our, our um, pulmonologist clinics in, our, in, a, in a new facility. Uh, 
But the idea is that if the patient is talking without the surgical mask and you don't have an N95 because you want to build rapport with your patient, so you don't, you know, and plus having an N95 for eight hours is almost impossible, <laughs> you use the UV light to kill it. Mm. Now, outside, I, I think it's, you know, I don't know if the UV... The UV rays from the sun is the same wavelength as the ones with the the black light. I see. I'm imagining someone walking around at a sanitarium just carrying a black light with them <laughs> and sort of stop. How are you doing today, sir? And uh, <laughs> bring holding it up. The other thing is that probably one of the things the way this, the the sanitariums or the hospitals are placed is depends on um, like the one in, I, I visited one in Guatemala and. And the way is the wind goes, uh, let's say, from east to west. So you want to put all your TV cases on the west side. So it, when the wind blows, it, the ones who are on the west will just go down on the on the, on the the yard, <laughs> not the other. So you don't put them on the east so you don't have this, like, you know, wave. Um, and it has to do also with uh, droplet amount and how, how the current. So, like, if you're outside and there is, you know, you're not close, you're probably less likely, but I, I would have to see what's the, um, how far away you have to be from the persons before you contract TB. Well, I think we should start to wrap up. So why don't we, Hannah, why don't we like figure out if there's any big questions that we need to ask here? We've definitely covered a ton of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. So we kind of went through treatment and screening for latent TB. And then we, now we've talked about um, diagnosis and early management and treatment for active TB. Um, were there any other, or what are kind of your take home points that you think our listeners should get out of this? So, one is that there are two uh, new guidelines out there. Um, there are more options for treatment. So, that's one. Um, they're very easy to, to look them during the CDC website uh, in the MMWR. Um, the other thing is that there are going to be changes on um, on who gets screened, and I think the change is going to be slow before we see it. If you suspect uh, of someone having um, active TB, you should always do an HIV test regardless. And then and you always err on the side of cautions. If you don't know, just isolate the patient. I like that. That's what I'm going to, I'm going to take that tact. Lila, we should let you go. It's, it's late and uh, I want you to be able to get home, enjoy the rest of your evening. So thank you so much. Watch out for the thunder and lightning out there. It's, it seems like. I might need a kayak to get home. (laughs) (laughs) This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. (laughs) <laughs> can't even no, not bad Hannah okay I'll, I'll allow it thank you uh, get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox we are committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge and to do that we need your feedback so please subscribe rate and review the show on iTunes or contact us at, at thecurbsiders at gmail.com special thanks to our producer for this episode uh, me and Yay. to our social media team uh, I'm on Twitter Beth Garbs Garbatelli is on our Instagram and Chris the Chew Man Chew is on our Facebook until next time I've been Hannah Rebecca Abrams and I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto uh, missing co-hosts uh, Stuart Kent Brigham and Paul Nelson Williams. Uh, good night to both of you wherever you are. He's a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> a doctor. <laughs>